second time back here talking at Wasawa. So it's really nice to be out in the communities and in the schools talking about um, the profession of nursing, which is really all I've known um, my adult career. So um, as he said, I am a family nurse practitioner at the Aspirus Corona Butter Clinic. Um, I will talk um, some briefly about myself and how I got to where I am, and then we'll talk about um, the profession of nursing and practitioner. So I'm a DC Service graduate. I went to three years of undergraduate school at UW La Crosse. Um, while I was going to my undergraduate, I got my CNA certification, um, which was a great experience for me as I was heading into my nursing career. Are there any CNAs in here? Anybody? Anybody in the medical field? Doing anything? EMTs? One? Anyone EMT? No? I know you're kind of young. First aid? Anybody certified? Lifeguard? Yeah? All right. Um, so yeah, very good experience <coughs> if um, you know that you're going to go into some avenue of the medical field. It always looks great on the resume. So while I was at La Crosse, I transferred to the Turbo for my bachelor's degree in nursing. Graduated in 2004, passed the State Board of Nursing exam. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and got a job at the Aspire Swasta Hospital working as a general nurse on a general medical floor. Did a lot of basic medical, some surgical nursing care. Did a lot of pediatrics. My love for pediatrics started there. Um, had a baby. Um, was working to have another baby, so I transitioned my job to the Aspirus Pediatric Clinic and did a lot of triage nursing. So in that position, I did a lot of education with new parents. It's interesting how the focus is on the child, but there's also a lot, a lot of teaching with parents and growth and development and things like that. I worked there for about two years and decided I was going to move on and get my master's degree to be a nurse practitioner. So I graduated from Concordia in 2012 and got a job where I am now at the Aspirus Clinic. Uh, so a couple definitions, I'm not going to go through these in too much detail, you guys can read those, but in general, a nurse practitioner is a health care professional who is educated and trained to provide health promotion and maintenance through the diagnosis and treatment of acute illness and chronic conditions. What I love about nursing is that you see a huge realm, you see basically from birth to death, depending on which area you choose to go into. Um, a nurse practitioner is a registered nurse who has acquired the expert knowledge base, complex decision-making skills, and clinical competencies for expanded practice, the characteristics of which are shaped by the context and or country in which she or he is credentialed to practice. So interestingly, the credentialing process is very state to state. There are certain things that nurse practitioners in the state of Wisconsin can do or cannot do compared to other states. I don't know all the details of the other states, but in the state of Wisconsin, a nurse practitioner can work independently, meaning I could open my own clinic down the road and not have any other, basically, medical doctor overseeing my practice. I don't know why. Is that right? History, again, I'm not going to touch too much on, but mid-20th century in the United States is where advanced practice nursing um, started nurse midwives and nurse anesthetists, so the people that put you to sleep during surgery, were some of the first nurses followed by psychiatric nurses. Interestingly, we're having a lot of newer um, nurses going into psychiatric nursing, as you probably know, it's a huge need right now. Um, very, very focused area of specialty with psychiatric nursing. So kindly wondered if that was my picture back in the day. <laughs> no, that's not. It's Florence Nightingale. She was the founder of nursing. You go into nursing, you'll hear all about Florence Nightingale. Um, let's see. So again, basically, you have to have a Bachelor of Science in nursing. If you decide maybe you're going to do nursing, but you don't want to do a four-year college degree, that's okay. You can start um, going to the tech, getting a, a two-year degree and decide from there. I know a lot of nurses, actually several that are now nurse practitioners with a master's degree that started as a two-year college degree. So that's a great place to start and get your feet wet and decide if that's the road you want to continue on. From your bachelor's, you attend a master's program. So again, I went through Concordia University. I was working full-time. I had an infant and a toddler at the same time. So I somehow managed through did online courses, which worked out really well. 
um, in that time of my life and did a lot of clinical rotations here in town. So I had a lot of networking through Aspires that I was able to do clinical rotations through there in various areas, um, pediatrics, women's health, um, and the clinics around town. We learn about health promotion, we learn about epidemiology, pathophysiology, anatomy, physical assessment, very, very key to our job, pharmacology, some medications, um, laboratory and radiology, radiology diagnostics, very, very important. So when a patient comes in and they have a sore throat or a cough or a stomach ache, I have to be able to know the appropriate questions to ask in order to be able to order the appropriate testing, whether that's lab tests or uh, radiology tests in order to know how to diagnose them and, and then treat them. So very, very important. We are very lucky actually in our clinic that we have a full lab staff and full radiology right in our clinic. So I can't imagine working without them at this point. Statistics and research, big part of nursing, not my favorite area, but it is important. Health policy, role development, and leadership. We do a lot of acute and chronic disease management. Um, so talking about not only wellness and keeping you healthy and doing vaccines, um, but also talking about if you do have diabetes, if you do have high blood pressure, if you do have high cholesterol, um, treating those things and trying to keep those managed so you don't get worse, basically. Um, the doctor of nursing practice, interestingly, so you might hear some nurse practitioners that call themselves doctors. They are do have a doctorate degree. They're not a medical doctor, but they do have advanced education beyond a master's program. They do additional classes and... At this point, I don't know that there's a huge difference between a family nurse practitioner that has their master's and somebody that has a doctorate. That individual that has that degree might you know, feel differently, but the ones that I, the, the nurses that I do know that have their doctorate really practice right now the same way that we, with our master's degree, do. So. Um, there are newer programs that are going to require the DNP program that you have to have your doctorate, which is, again, um, that little extra additional um, education after the master's degree. I'm kind of grandfathered into that at this point. And after completing the required education, the nurse practitioner must pass a national board certifying exam, which I have done. There's two different organizations within the state of Wisconsin that support that certification. Mine is through the American Nurses Credentialing Center. And there's one other, I can't think of it off the top of my head. The other thing we have to apply for is additional credentials, um, including prescriptive authority. So the DEA um, is something that is required in order to prescribe medicines, not, not most medicines, but actually controlled substances. So pain medications, narcotics, certain stimulants, for example, that people use for ADD or ADHD, those have to be prescribed by a licensed individual beyond just your nurse practitioner. You have to have a certification through the DEA. There's education that's required every several years and there is an extra fee for that test to be done every three years. <coughs> so what, how often do you have to do a continuum? Great question. So we have to have 75 hours every five years. Um, through that, I've been able to do some traveling, which is really kind of nice. We went to New York as a family to attend a conference. Um, we're going to be going to San Antonio to attend a conference, but there's a lot of local ones. Bone and Joint locally put some on, Marshall Clinic has some, um, Aspires has some. So they can be big, long conferences, or they can be short, one day, sort of different. You know, Bone and Joint, I went to one, I think, in April in town, and it just talked about different specialties within orthopedics that was really interesting. And a certain percentage of those extra classes have to be through pharmacology, so learning about medications which is super huge and important. You're reading about um, FDA things coming out, reports, all of that. I just had a patient call yesterday that said, boy, this Zantac that I take over the counter for my reflux, I was just reading, it can cause cancer, should I continue to take it? So we're always doing research and always learning. And medications are taken off the market if they're not you know, proven to be safe after some time. So that continuing education is a huge, huge piece. And yep. who pays for that? Um, we are given a stipend, a certain amount of money per, in our contract per year to for education. If we want to do above and beyond that, it's out of our pocket. Um, and, and I've really attended some really great conferences. 
again, I mean, the wound clinic holds conferences. I went to one in Marshfield um, in like February about pediatrics, which is what I love. So it's really nice to kind of be able to pick and choose your area of specialty and what you'd like to learn. So, uh, and you never know. Maybe you go to a conference and you learn a lot about cardiology or something like that, and you're like, wow, maybe I don't like family medicine anymore. Maybe I want to switch to cardiology. So you never know what might happen. So going back to salary really depends on the area, the state, um, your years of experience, and really what you can produce and how successful you are. If you can prove that you're a hard worker, um, you're going to make more money. So my standard salary per my contract is a standard salary that I get regardless of how many patients I see, and then a bonus, a stipend for working above and beyond, which is some calculation that I don't even understand. But Again, you work hard and, and it, will, it will pay off. Um, average salary is rating between 98000 and 108000 I would say that's pretty consistent. The ninety-eight might be less in certain areas, not necessarily in the Midwest, um, but I'm thinking more like on the East Coast, those salaries might be a little bit less. And again, depends on your specialty. Do you work with, are you an MP that works in trauma surgery? Or are you an NP that works, I hate to say it, but in fact in the schools, you know, those nurses unfortunately don't, don't seem to make a lot of money. Not a reason not to do it, but money isn't everything. Median pay, 113000 My assumption is that is a, a base pay and not a salary with additional bonuses attached to that. Um, Primary factor in the dramatic increase in starting salaries is skyrocketing demand for NPs, recognizing them as the fifth most highly sought after advanced health professionals in 2016. So that statistic is a little bit old, but um, definitely, definitely strong demand. We find that we are a great way to bridge the gap between the shortage in physicians, MDs, DOs, um, and nothing really. How many of you see a physician, a medical doctor, doctor of osteopathic medicine? I would assume most of you see a doctor. Yes, raise your hand if you see a doctor for your primary. You go in for your physical every year. Raise them high. Yeah, a good majority. How many see a physician assistant or nurse practitioner? One. Yeah. So um, it's interesting. It's really interesting. We tend to see a trend with nurse practitioners being in specialties. Um, Aspirus Cardiology, I'm just speaking Aspirus, that's all I know, I'm sorry, nothing against any of the other healthcare um, organizations around town. Um, ton, ton, there's probably over 20 nurse practitioners or physician assistants, mid-level providers, whatever name you want to give us, that work with just cardiology. I know there's ones in pulmonology, I know there's a nurse practitioner that works for the trauma surgeons. Um, GI has a lot. Um, dermatology for us has none, rheumatology has none, endocrinology, so dealing with hormones, diabetes, um, thyroid disease, they have a lot as well. So primary care, not as many. Always interesting comparison. Do you guys have any PAs coming in later this? No? Okay. I can get you any if you like some. But anyway. So nurse practitioner versus a PA, which is a physician assistant. So you can see the comparison here. NP has a bachelor's of science degree in nursing and then a master's of science degree in nursing. PAs, any undergraduate baccalaureate degree, pretty interesting. You could have your four-year degree in finance or business and apply to PA school um, and get accepted and then you do your education from there. I thought that was always pretty interesting. I know some people that have no experience in medicine and then they go to PA school. So. Um, NPs, again, can work independently, and PAs cannot. So they can see patients independently, but they need to be overseen by a physician, a medical doctor. So I mean, to you check the charts and stuff? Yeah. Doesn't have to be in the room with you? Correct. Just... Correct. And I know some great PAs. Um, I, I know a lot of them that work in orthopedics. Um, fantastic. Uh, nurse practitioners have a focus on a nursing model. So when I, when I first was deciding around your age, what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I always thought I wanted to be a teacher, a teacher, 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 but I also like this component of nursing. And so in my opinion, I picked a great mix of the two because I educate my patients all the time. Educate them about why we're doing something. Here's your symptoms, here are the treatment options. What should we do? Let's figure it out together. Why should we do this or why should we do that? Um, again, with parents of children, 
education about what is normal for a baby, what is what is not normal for a toddler as they're growing up, um, what are side effects to medications. Pharmacists do a lot of that, but when I'm talking to a patient about a medication that they might be on for long term, they're going to want to know why should they be on it. And PAs tend to focus on a medical model. I joke sometimes with some of the docs that I work with, you've got to see the whole picture. They're kind of trained to kind of have these blinders on and find out exactly what's going on and treat it. Um, and I think sometimes they lose a little bit of the, the nursing, the, I don't know how to explain it, the, the sensitivity, the, yeah, so. Job versatility for both, job satisfaction, I would imagine it's equally equal for both. Statistically lower salary for NPs, I don't know where I got this information from. I know it was credible, but I don't know why that is. And statistically higher salary for PAs. And maybe that's, again, the specialties that they work in. I don't know if I know any physician assistants that work in, just me personally, in um, family medicine. So perhaps it's them working in specialties that bring the average higher salary. And again, both vital members of the healthcare team. So practice, let's see. Let's go through some of the roles. So a nurse practitioner's role might include the following, medical diagnosis and treatment, as we've talked about, evaluation and management of acute and chronic diseases. Think of when you go to the walk-in, you have a sore throat, you have a cough, you have ear pain, is it pneumonia, is it ear infection, is it allergies, is it a cold? So gathering all that information, evaluating you to determine exactly what's going on until you know how to treat you appropriately. Chronic diseases, again, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, depression, anxiety, other psychiatric <coughs> issues, Diabetes is big, and then we can get into all the different components of cardiac issues and lung issues and all of those. Most people, from a primary care perspective, that have severe lung disease, have major cardiac issues, they're seeing a specialist, they're seeing a cardiologist, they're seeing a pulmonologist, they're seeing the, the kidney doctor, they're seeing those areas of specialty, and that's probably where most of those people belong anyway. So, have you seen any of this stuff related to this... Uh and not personally. I did have a, I think she was just 18 year old male came in a couple weeks ago for a physical. Was good, was fine, was healthy, and just started to freak out. And he's like, I've had this cough, I've been vaping, I've been, I just read all this stuff, and, and he was scared. And I think it's okay to be scared. And so we educate, we talk about it. In my practice, I want people to know why we don't do things. We don't tell kids, you know, don't talk to strangers. We, don't, we, I want, we tell kids, don't drink energy drinks. Why don't we drink energy drinks? I want you to know why. Why don't we vape? This is the reason why we don't do these things. Um, and he, he was very concerned, and so we talked about doing a chest x-ray to see, make sure everything's fine. Now, it doesn't tell me his lung function, but it tells me what the anatomy looks like. And I think that alone was reassuring for him enough. And he said, I'm done. I'm done with it. So, yeah. Um, sometimes we learn from other people's mistakes, often in life, right? Mm -hmm. So, you guys, believe it or not, are at the age where you don't always know consequences to your actions, or you think you're invincible. So, it's just education and teaching. And adults make mistakes, good people make bad decisions, um, but sometimes we need to look <coughs> beyond that and, and think about what those consequences might be. Um, Patient history is conducting physical exams, very, very important. Requesting diagnostic imaging. Again, I order MRIs, I order CT scans, I order x-rays, uh, various cardiac tests sometimes, uh, things like a Holter monitor, which is a, a EKG machine that people can wear if they're having weird heartbeats and things like that. And then interpreting those. So the important thing is I can order a chest x-ray all day, but if the result comes back to me or I'm looking it up on the machine and I don't know what I'm looking at, it does me no good. So one thing I've had to learn in my practice is that I'm, I'm not a nephrologist, I'm not a kidney doctor or whatever, if I have somebody coming in with, let's say, like a dermatological issue, like a skin issue, and I was like, oh, I really want to treat this, I know what's going on, I'm going to order this test and this test, then I better know what I'm going to do with that information if I'm going to order that. And it's okay to refer people on to the specialist. I've had to realize that a little bit in my career. So. How do you deal with a lot of that stuff with insurance? It's a battle. Um, I had a great case of this that's been going on for two weeks. I have a lady that has really bad sciatic pain, and she's not responding to pain medicine. 
physical therapy won't touch her because she's not had an MRI, right? So they're afraid that they're going to do something wrong. She, some of the pain medications make her too sleepy. She doesn't feel like she can go to work, but work's begging her to come back because they're short staffed. And so I said, I'm concerned that she blew a disc in her back, so I need to order an MRI. And we've been waiting for insurance, waiting for insurance. She's calling back every day. I'm still in pain. The specialist won't see her till the MRI is done so that they know what's going on. Like I said, PT won't touch her. So I just got her information yesterday that her insurance denied it until she does the PT. Well, PT doesn't want it. So it, it gets to be a mess. You know, certain medications that are really, really new, great medications in the market for different things, respiratory, asthma is a great example of that, uh, they're not generic. So until you've met your deductible, which might be sometimes four, six, eight thousand dollars for a family, you're paying out of pocket. You know, if you're paying for an inhaler, that's 300 bucks that is really good for your asthma. So we deal with a lot of that. The nursing staff is really great about trying to manage some of that. A lot of it is online now, but we battle that a lot. You know, it doesn't matter sometimes. I can get on the phone and call the doc at the insurance company and say, hey, here's the clinical information. They'll still may say, hey, it doesn't match your policy. So we get figured out. It's frustrating, very frustrating. Um, ordering physical and occupational therapy, other rehab treatments, again, prescribing medications for acute and chronic illnesses, preventing prenatal care. I don't do that. I'm not a certified nurse midwife as much as I love babies and children. Well child care, again, lots of vaccines, immunizations, technical broken development. A lot of things come up um, at well child or exam. Um, Health maintenance, Biggie, when you come in for your physical, we're not just trying to make sure that you're healthy. How many times do people come in for a physical and I heard a heart murmur? And they're not dizzy and they're not short of breath and they don't have symptoms. How many times do people come in for a physical and they say, I feel fine and their blood pressure's through the roof and they could have a heart attack or a stroke? Um, so many different scenarios. People say, well, I don't need blood work, you know. I feel fine and we find out that their kidneys are failing. They don't have symptoms yet. Um, diabetes, great example. I had somebody the other day came in, her blood sugar was 564, so off to the ER she went. She felt fine. Wouldn't have known if we didn't check her lab. She could have ended up in a diabetic coma. It's just sometimes the way it goes. So you can get in, stay healthy, go in once a year for your exams, and they're preventive. Your insurance should be covering those types of things. So not so much at your age, but this, your generation males tend to not go to the doctor very much, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, usually they're like, my wife scheduled the appointment. That's the only reason I'm here. Um, minor surgeries and procedures. So our clinic actually does a fair amount. Uh, let's see, mole removals, lesion removals. We get into some of the icky, dirty, gooey stuff at our clinic. As far as cyst removals, drainages, things like that. Um, two of the doctors at our clinic do some gynecological procedures, um, like colposcopies, so if you want to do the testing, back at normal, we need to do a biopsy of the cervix, they do that in our office. Some of the doctors were doing vasectomies for male birth control. Uh, let's see, birth control devices, I do place one of those, one of the ones that goes in the arm, it's a minor in-office procedure, I do those. Wart removals, those are very common. I think we do a fair amount of procedural things in our primary care clinic that probably a lot of primary care clinics don't do. And again, lots of counseling and education. Okay, I think in my work life. I don't go to the hospital as much as I would love to. On the rare occasion that I've had a patient of mine that's been in the hospital, I just do a social visit. I just step in and see how they're doing and say hi, but I don't provide them any care. I don't, I don't, I chose not to have any hospital privileges. I don't have a pager, which for me is very nice. 